Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. Ecosystem services are found all around us. It is the air we breathe, the water we drink. It is the sunlight making all physical attributes come to life around us. We will explore how these physical sight characteristics are retrieved, managed, and used to help the animals of this world thrive and survive, and that includes us humans. We are the biggest keystone species on this planet, and the largest accumulated user of natural resources. Resources of the land have been used by indigenous populations since time immemorial. Whether it was water, air, soils to grow foods, or wood to make fire to cook and heat with, we have always been, and still are, reliant on these natural resource amenities. However, our human desire to derive benefits from the environment have become more and more concentrated on walking the path to deeper and further exploitation of plant harvest, deep earth mining, and even the concentration of toxic pollutants generated from the resource utilization. We will take a walk into economics as we explore positive and negative externalities created by ecosystem services. As I walk you through this journey, I recommend you remove the blinders hanging over your brow. These block some of the visions of what is seen all around you. The way I see this landscape is most likely different than the way you see it. Hmm, is that important? No, not really. What is important is seeing the lands and interactions for what they really are. These are natural landscapes existing in response to what has happened before. They will react to what happens next. Just like you and me. I was brought into the world with a father who loved to fish. That is what we did together. It took me a long time, like decades to recognize that catching salmon was not really the purpose of fishing with my dad and sisters. Sure, we loved to catch fish, but it became more about spending time together, interacting, forming our community of life. This extended to more trips with new family members as we fished, hunted, or collected mushrooms. This was our way of growing our family, making connections. It is not something included in quizzes or tests about natural resource services or amenities. This is about living. Life according to Dr. Bill. And for me, it was instigated by the natural environment. We start to put some light on this scene as we find out what natural resources are. It's the amenities, the artifacts generated by our living things in this world. It's the fish I catch, the lilies I pick from the garden. <laughs> of course, we have industries that grow these natural resources, harvest them, package them, and put them into sales in this consumption world we live in. That is the life we have made. That honey you bought in the jar at the store is a natural resource, collected by honeybee processors, but the bottle, label, and its presentation were all part of advertising and marketing. Still, the honey is a naturally occurring resource. For me, I get the raw honey from the local bee apiary. I get about six gallons a year. But that is a different story, related to medicinal uses and my joy of natural product consumption. For all of us, natural resources include the world around us, fresh air and space. This becomes more apparent in our social distancing realities, made possible by our perceptions of our natural environment. Natural resources occur within the environment in their original and native form, undisturbed by humanity. They take years to form without the intervention of humans. These natural resources are derived from the environment. While a few of them are used for our survival, like water and air, some of them include coal, gas, or oil, and are used for satisfying our daily needs and wants. From forests, to mountains, to minerals, to coastal shores and wetlands, each of these natural resources has its own importance. You know I often repeat the idea of define and discuss with example. Now I put a hat on that mannequin, making it presentable to the world. I just defined what the natural resource is, and we have started this discussion. I enter now to make example of forestry as it relates to forest products, specifically to wood products. 
This all starts from the basis of growing trees. The goal of the timber management company is to make lumber to build your house, to make cardboard to ship your next Amazon package, to make paper towels you will use in the kitchen as you clean up some spilled juice. Part of forestry is the process of growing timber to make the forest products we have used all of our lives. I use it even as a heating source as I burn firewood to eat my home. This starts to touch a topic you covered or will cover when you take a class in microeconomics. It is called externalities, coming as positive or negative externalities. These are the benefits or costs borne by someone not part of the original transaction. This is the deer and elk populations that were bolstered because of the openings created when thinning the forest. More sunlight hitting the forest floor enabled new plant life the herbivores could eat. The positive externality came to the hunting cooperative because of increased deer populations. When those logs arrived at the lumber mill, they were processed by peeling off the bark, sorting them into species and diameter by length. These logs were sawn into boards, sorted again, kiln dried, sanded, and made ready for packaging. Finally, the banded units were put into trucks and rail cars for delivery to your local Home Depot. The wood is the natural resource product. Everything else is a service provided by the people acting on this commodity. When the entire cost of the board is considered, as it rests in your home, only a small fraction is actual value of the natural resource board. The rest is the cost from stump to your wall. Still, it was all made possible by the value of the natural resource commodity, wood. Now we spin back to the forest and consider this from the perspective of the forest land owner. That entity might be in the place to grow trees and in the process, create wildlife habitat, riparian areas where fish and other aquatic species thrive. It may be to the benefit of municipal water supplies seeking clean water from the pristine rivers of the ecosystem. This is where attention is focused on the forest land resource as provider of many attributes. It is not only the timber used for forest products, it is the air purified by those needles and leaves, the water filtered above and below ground. It is about the atmospheric carbon dioxide taken through each tree's stomata to remove the carbon from making woody plant structures as it releases the oxygen back to the atmosphere. That is the clean and pure air we all breathe. We are the positive externality benefactors of this process. We may not be part of the original transaction, but we breathe the air with pleasure. Here, the clean air is a natural resource made possible by the growing trees, planted and managed by companies and government agencies. Those commodities are all naturally occurring in the environment. This includes the timber industry, fishing industry, mining and petroleum industries. These take on a vastly different attitude, linked by the naturally existing biotic and abiotic nature of their genesis. The resource naturally exists, so it is the processing that makes them unique. In this light, even the Christmas tree farmer is producing a natural resource commodity. That Douglas fir and noble fir Christmas tree is analogous to a 2x4 board, at least for this discussion. However, this should not be taken to imply that all primary products are covered as natural resources. That changes when we look to agricultural products like wheat, barley, or lentils. Why? Because those plants are not naturally occurring where they are grown, thriving only because of cultivation, fertilization, pesticides, fungicides, harvest, and processing. We do not classify agricultural products as natural resources for several reasons. Agricultural products are cultivated rather than extracted from the natural environment. Most generally, when your timber is left to grow without cultivation, the trees age and remain in the balance with the ecosystem. They have been growing here for millennia and will continue long after we are out of here. Agricultural products grow off-site plant species, planted within specific norms. Many times they require irrigation, fertilization, and chemical control against invaders. 
They grow from the soils, with natural water or irrigation, are harvested and processed. At this stage, they are not very different from the timber log in need of processing into lumber. Hmm, some assembly required. These commodities all share the commonality of being a biotic resource growing within the abiotic environment of these lands surrounding us. I call this a common environmental science foundation. We may call it environmental science, forestry, natural resource management, agriculture, or mining, but that shared link of biotic and abiotic resources is what unites our natural resource or agricultural tasks. Even though our commonality links us, we do have some striking differences. We need to see and recognize what these disparities are. We will put these into categories of renewability. The first two are easily considered as a binary option, but that perpetual clause needs some perspective. Watch for that one. Spin gears on this non-renewable category for a couple minutes. These four types of non-renewables include the open-pit coal mining, tar sands mining, natural gas exploitation, and silver mining. These are only a few types of non-renewable natural resources, given this moniker based on what renewability means. We all watched that opening video to this class as we saw Pangaea break apart and reform. I identified the windy city of Chicago about 600 million years ago, but Wyoming, Alberta, and Nevada were still in the brewing pot about that time. So on that scale, it might take a half billion years to cook up some new coal beds. From our perspective, this is non-renewable. However, we have identified these natural resources and developed ways to extract energy from them, like petroleum, coal, and natural gas. We find silver stored deep in the lithosphere where we can drill down to it, extract it, and use it for our commercial activities to build ships, buildings, infrastructure, and even mint coins. These are fantastic natural resources to reveal. However, value extraction has revealed some catastrophically negative externalities. As we talk of natural resource commodity externalities, I give some examples centered in northern Idaho. In a microeconomics course, you learn about both positive and negative externalities, and what that means both from an economic standpoint and from what has become a monumental human health problem. We are headed to the Silver Valley of Idaho, up the Coeur d'Alene River, through Kellogg and Wallace. This area is currently the home of the world-class ski mountain called Silver Mountain Resort. In the late 1880s, a boom in mining activity in Idaho's Silver Valley followed the concentration of railroad lines through what was previously considered by European Americans to be inaccessible wilderness. Silver Mountain became the largest iron smelting facility in the world. This area was known as a center of extensive silver and other metal mining and processing. Commercial mining and processing efforts resulted in extensive contamination of water, land, and air endangering residents of the Coeur d'Alene Indian tribe, which had traditionally depended on fish from the waterways as part of its substance. The unanticipated complication came from lead poisoning from iron smelting operations, contaminating water and the air of the region. Mine tailings were dumped directly into the Coeur d'Alene River and its tributaries which became polluted with high levels of sulfur dioxide, lead, and other metals. In 1973, a stack cleaner accident damaged how the smelter cleaned contaminants from the smokestack. Bunker Hill Mining Company's management decided to continue operations even though the stack spewed toxic lead, cadmium, and zinc into the air around the smelter. Winds carried the contaminants across the valley for miles. By 1974, the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality tested blood lead levels in local children to find the highest lead contamination ever recorded anywhere in the world. Approximately 26% of two-year-old children had dangerously high levels of lead in their blood, which had long-term negative consequences for their health, especially intellectual functioning and achievement. Once poisoned, 
The effects are not reversible. Only further contamination can be prevented. The water in rivers turned opaque gray and brown, earning this stream the nickname Lead Creek. An estimated 100 million tons of arsenic, cadmium, and zinc were released into the air, along with 30,000 tons of lead. As of 2015, about $865 million of cleanup costs had been spent. But the end is not yet in sight. Natural resources extracted from these regions are not to blame for this catastrophe. Errors of processing caused the problems discovered. Be sure to always reason the cause and effect conclusions you make. We look into the category of perpetual natural resources to see geothermal, solar, and hydro energy. Solar power is a banner carrier of this category. Overall, electricity production is big business. From coal burning plants emitting high carbon dioxide levels to the atmosphere and acid rain pollution, to hydroelectric dams along the Columbia River that block migrating salmon from their natal spawning grounds. We use those power supplies in ever increasing amounts. We also consider solar, wind, nuclear, and even biomass electricity generation options to realize each method carries its own private and social cost burdens. We know that rational people respond to taxes, regulations, and incentives that influence their decisions. Negative externalities catch the attention of people investigating the need to correct a wrong, that is, penalizing folks who are not part of the transaction. But what about a positive externality? Can those be taxed into existence? The reverse of a tax is an incentive, a subsidy. We have heard the benefits of solar and wind energy and how these forms of power generation do not create carbon dioxide emissions, create acid rain, or lead to global climate change. So why not subsidize creators of positive externalities? I introduce you to Bill Camp, Living Off the Grid. When you're as plugged in as this, you think the electricity bill would go through the roof. But this homeowner never pays an electric bill, ever. Thank there you. you go. That's because Bill Kemp has his very own power supply, a system of solar panels that keeps his home, located just outside Ottawa, Canada, running just like yours and mine. It's called living off the grid. Yep, that means Bill Kemp doesn't rely on electricity from any utility company to power his home. He's completely independent. Now, when you hear the words off-gridder, What's the first thing that comes to mind? I'm betting you didn't picture this. I gotta be honest, I honestly thought, I pictured a guy out in the big, woods, big beard. kinda like that, <laughs> frying a raccoon over a Bunsen burner. <laughs> Bill, an energy consultant and best-selling author of the Renewable Energy Handbook, and his wife Lorraine are one of an estimated 180,000 families living in off-grid homes in North America today. So this is going to be my first taste of solar brewed, solar brewed cup of cappuccino. cappuccino yep. Bill's journey began on the grid. He and Lorraine wanted to move, but they found out it would cost a small fortune to bring electric lines in. So they decided instead to invest that money into building a new home off the grid. Well, a, a lot of people thought that we were just plain crazy. Uh, Lorraine was very supportive. Her question was, you know, can I still run my hairdryer? And I said, absolutely, I guarantee that. That was 20 years ago, and they've never looked back. Two large rotating solar arrays track the sun every 90 seconds, each array generating over a thousand watts of energy, enough to run a large appliance. How do you go from the sun billions of miles away, um, how does that thing run your hair dryer in the morning. <laughs> okay, I, well, it's, it's really very simple. The sunlight comes in and hits these photovoltaic panels. These are like great big integrated circuits on steroids. The sunlight charges a bank of batteries in Bill's basement, feeds into an inverter, a device that converts the energy into normal household power, then flows through the home. And then into your uh, electrical devices, the hair dryer. Long after the sun goes down, the charged batteries keep the lights on and anything else Bill needs well into the night. On a cloudy day, a 1,500-watt wind turbine picks up the slack. And in case of Armageddon or a spell of gray skies and no wind, a backup half biodiesel, half diesel generator kicks in to charge up the batteries. It would be pretty tough to lose power here. 
Oh, and did I mention this living off the grid is pretty low maintenance? All Bill has to do is pour distilled water into the batteries about two to three times a year. My uncle gets a colonoscopy more often than you check your <laughs> batteries. So. Bill and Lorraine Kemp say they're getting off the grid had its upfront costs about $40,000 worth. For other homeowners, the cost really depends on how much electricity you think you need to live comfortably. It's a small price to pay for a life unplugged. In other words, the good life. In Ontario, Canada, Patty Kim, Energy Now. Bill and Maureen Camp have found and maintain a sustainable method of using the most fundamental abiotic natural resources, wind and sun, to capture the energy they need to live. Even their backup power generation supply is biodiesel. Their house is made from wood frames, with a desktop made from maple wood. These are the natural resources the camps toast with a sip of wine. And we can recognize the wine as an agricultural product. They all come together nicely. Renewable resources such as timber and fish are capable of regenerating as a population after members are harvested. Notice these living entities, deer, fish, and plants, add in abiotic water and we have a renewable label for all. The link between renewable natural resource management and ecology is that ecology is the foundation and framework science for the practice of natural resource management. Renewable resources are capable of regenerating after harvesting, so potentially their stocks can be utilized forever, at least from our perspective. Biotic renewable resources or bioresources include wild animals that are hunted for food or for biomaterials such as deer, elk, moose, ducks, fish, and lobster. Forest biomass is harvested for lumber, fiber, or energy. Wild plants that are gathered as sources for food. Plants cultivated as sources of food, medicine, materials, or energy. Non-renewability of a renewable resource can be the consequence of overuse beyond a minimum threshold level necessary for the resource to regenerate. Progressive forest management utilizes appropriate tools to the benefits of biotic plants and animals living along with abiotic features of each land resource. Even when forests are managed in a non-sustainable manner, leading to a degradation in plants, like the disappearance of a species, we think of it as a loss to the system of sustainable growth. Degradation of an ecosystem that reduces the efficiency of an ecological process within an ecosystem can also inhibit recovery and renewability of a resource. Hydrophobic soils and extreme fire incidents beyond the normal range of variability can damage soil processes and change the character of the site for centuries to come. Again, this puts it in terms of human time frames. Be sure to consider the anthropogenic influence beyond the severity of the burn and resistance to control measures. Fire is natural, but fire intensity can be reactive to human perturbations. Be careful. Degradation may be a natural process and a part of the anticipated flow of natural events. Forests grow and sometimes the wildfires are part of the natural progression to sustain a species. This includes fungus, herbivores, and omnivores, each thriving in the environmental conditions created. Is this logging or is it mining timber volume from a specific place? When put into human terms of longevity, this is viewed by some as mining the timber volume. This western red cedar was about 400 years old when it was cut. Do we measure sustainability in terms of a tree's life cycle or one of our own life cycles? Nevertheless, replicating this tree in this form will not be achieved within our lives. Seedlings on this site perpetuate the sustainability of the species, population, and community. These ponderosa pine saplings are the start of another rotation of trees and the life they enable for the environments they influence. Keep your attention to the sustainability of energy flowing through these sites, pressing through the soils, with water, and using sunlight. Keeping that foundation stable is what carries the sustainability bucket. We float over to the Quinault Indian Reservation, Tohola, Washington, 
along the Pacific Ocean shoreline. This is at the pour point of the Quinault River into the Pacific Ocean where razor clams are being collected. Tribal members have been doing this since time immemorial. However, the take has reduced and the clams are getting smaller. <laughs> What's up with that? This part of the discussion gets rapid responses to find the culprit. Some assert that global warming is the cause. While that diagnosis seems to be the catch-all for a lot of problems, it avoids the rigor needed to really understand why it is happening. Others tie this problem with ocean acidification, rising sea levels, or pollution. While these most likely have an impact, the overriding cause may be more linked to nutrient cycling the clams need to thrive and survive. We come back to the issue of energy flow through the ecosystem. We will continue to visit this situation as we explore trophic levels within this ecosystem. Be alert to trophic cascades and how the apex predator in this environment affects the clams along this shoreline. Let's head out from this shoreline to some deeper water, into the ocean, to catch some salmon. Hey, this is me again, with my dad, spending some time together as we caught a couple salmon. We were sports fishermen, <laughs> we did pretty good at it. Salmon are considered a renewable resource. They have life cycles that run on a four to six year cycle. When I catch a dozen salmon a year, is that threatening sustainability of the species? Well, of course not. But what about when 15,000 sports fishermen do it? Still, that is not a species-threatening event. How about the commercial harvest that takes one boatload on each catch? That's all 15,000 sports fishermen catch in each net. They all do this throughout the season. Of course, they process it and sell it to willing buyers. Apply that to mushroom harvesters, firewood cutters, deer and elk hunters, and about everyone harvesting natural resource commodities. We can control this only through enforcement of state and federal regulations to regulate the take. While doing this, we also trample on the indigenous people's use of this natural resource, something they have been doing since time immemorial. When put into this context, we can look at this through the lens of value to society. I started this show with a photograph of me and my father and sister. Obviously, our experience was non-material, building on our recreational, spiritual, and natural heritage esteem. We feasted on the fish, but also on the experiences we shared. Does this make my natural resource values different from those of someone else? Are my values different from yours? Well, of course they are, and that is expected. There is no reason for people to find conflict in how we differently value the use of natural resources. To each his own. On the other hand, when natural resources are utilized and the conversion of the commodity creates negative externalities that harms people, places, or things, then we have cause to effect change. Start the discussion. Find the solution. Implement the change to find where no harm is done. Natural heritage comes from features consisting of physical and biological formations which are of outstanding universal value from the aesthetic or scientific point of view. These natural sites or natural areas of outstanding universal value from the point of view of science, conservation, natural beauty, or indigenous heritage constitutes the social values of the world, eclipsing any financial measure. These are the features of cultural and natural significance which is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for the present and future generations of all humanity. As such, the permanent protection of this heritage is of the highest importance to the international community. This defines who we are. The origins of modern history of ecosystem services are to be found in the late 1970s. It starts with the utilitarian framing of beneficial ecosystem functions as services in order to create public interest in biodiversity conservation. The benefits we derive directly are the results of many natural processes that operate within Earth ecosystems. Natural resources are not invulnerable and indefinitely available. 
The complexity of Earth's ecosystems pose a challenge for scientists as they try to understand how relationships are interwoven among organisms, processes, and their surroundings. For example, the area of the forest floor, the detritus upon it, the microorganisms in the soil and characteristics of the soil itself will all contribute to the abilities of that forest for providing ecosystem services, like carbon sequestration, water purification, and erosion prevention to other areas within a watershed. Provisioning services such as production of food and fiber, cultural services such as recreation and spiritual value, and supporting services like nutrient or carbon cycling. These are the byproducts of a functioning ecosystem. In our economics lingo, these are the positive externalities produced by functioning ecosystems. We capture the natural resource provisions from the land. For me personally, these provisions have been the harvest of wild edible mushrooms from the forest, the huckleberries or the adaptogenic herbs and roots, and even the firewood I cut, split, stack and burn in my home for the winter heat. And we are watching my grandson, Daniel, when he was nine years old. This was his first yeah, prove-it-to-me really piece of firewood. Uh, sometimes the lessons we learn while experiencing the natural environment and what we can realize from it is more valuable than the commodity we derive from these labors. Go, Take aim. Yeah! What do you call it, Daniel? Prove-it-to-me piece. Yeah. There are so many natural commodities in this natural environment, many we are completely oblivious about. For instance, this is a birch tree with taps drilled into it. Those taps are the same as we use for bleeding syrup from a maple tree. I had no idea when I first saw these, but the birch juice tastes fantastic. That was one of the non-timber forest products production projects I was able to lead with my Russian partners. Well, I worked there. It was to process the juice, bottle it, and adorn them with this attractive label. Those were marketed all across the Russian Federation, into Japan, South Korea, and ultimately into Europe. Resource extraction is guided by regulations put into place by governing bodies with authority. It may be a county, state, tribal authority, or the federal government. These regulations have been initially placed to protect air and water quality, to mitigate negative effects of natural disasters. These are the laws put in place to manage how we use the natural resources, not to destroy what we regard with high esteem. The natural world provides us with the essential services we require for living. These services are called ecological services the interactions among organisms and their natural environments, including the cycling of water and basic nutrients that humans are able to use and capitalize on. Ecological services include purification of air and water, mitigation of floods and droughts, generation and renewal of soil and natural vegetation, support of diverse human culture, and providing aesthetic beauty with the intellectual stimulation that lifts the human spirit. The past two centuries of economic growth and prosperity, often applied with little regard for the environment, has carried an incredibly high cost in terms of water and air pollution, loss of natural areas and biodiversity. Is this a cost that will be expressed by future generations as an ecological debt? Can it be repaid as we strive to become more environmentally sustainable? These are questions we all need to consider and decide how we will take action to make a change. Because of ecosystem flexibility and the importance of balance, it is extremely important to reduce the threat of irreversible damage to our ecological systems. We need to focus our energies to topics of land use change and irreversible conversion of landscapes and their ecological functions. Ecocentrism is a point of view that recognizes the ecosphere, rather than the biosphere, as central in importance, and attempts to redress the imbalance created by anthropocentrism, that is, referring to a human-created or anthropogenic point of view. In philosophy, 
Anthropocentrism can refer to the point of view that humans are the primary holders of moral standing. We are one of the users, but how do you view this? You should talk about this. Remember that acronym ends with NO, a personal journey you can take now. Natural resource management refers to the management of natural resources such as land, water, soil, plants, and animals, with a particular focus on how management affects the quality of life for both present and future generations. We call this stewardship. Natural resource management deals with the way in which people and natural landscapes interact. It brings together land use planning, water management, biodiversity conservation, and the future sustainability of industries like agriculture, mining, tourism, fisheries, and forestry. It recognizes that people and their livelihoods rely on the health and productivity of our landscapes, and their actions as stewards of the land play a critical role in maintaining this health and productivity. The issue of biodiversity conservation is regarded as an important element in natural resource management. Biodiversity is a comprehensive concept, which is a description of the existence of natural diversity. Biodiversity has been termed the variety of life, as related to topics of biodiversity organization. Threats wrecking havoc on biodiversity include habitat fragmentation, putting a strain on the already stretched biological resources along with forest deterioration, and deforestation. Precautionary management of biodiversity is a critical part of natural resource management. Adaptive management applies as a management approach that expressly tackles the uncertainty and dynamics of complex systems. This is what we face, and who we are guides our solution set. I keep taking you on a visit with the gray wolves in the continental United States. About a hundred years ago, the wolf was declared a nuisance. It was hunted, trapped, poisoned, and ultimately eradicated by 1960. Then, in 1973, this was reversed when placing the wolf on the endangered species list. Gray wolf populations have recovered in great numbers by wolves migrating from Canada where they were not eradicated. The first federal recovery efforts were concentrated at Yellowstone National Park. Today, in this context, our natural environment system is the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. The social system of human attitude, values, behavior, institutions, and technology. The overriding economic system focuses on human attitudes, institutions, and behavior related to the allocation of land, labor, and capital. The political system is policy, laws, courts, and public agencies adhering to the 1973 Endangered Species Act. Wolf recovery is substantial enough that they are legally hunted in some states, while being protected in others. The effects of ecosystem balance are achieved only by all interacting species in an ecosystem, from a major predatory species to the seemingly inconsequential sea otter. Everything we have been discussing rotates around how we humans interact with the biosphere, with this planet we occupy. We started this journey with discussions recognizing the quaternary period as our current term. Within this term, we have been through Galician, Calabrian, Middle and Upper Ages, all bounded within the Pleistocene Epoch. In 2016, the International Commission on Stratigraphy recommended creation of a new epoch, the Anthropocene Epoch. They hung the term with a start date of 1950. This monumental change is significant. It is a good time to consider what we have done to improve our planet, and what we have done to harm it. Some of these harms are easy to identify. Some take more effort to truly understand the impacts we make. Some of the harms have been caught with time enough remaining to correct them before irreparable damages were reached. However, recognizing damage is not enough. We need to instigate corrective actions to avoid irreparable harm to this planet we live on. We will continue to investigate the wolf and what it means to natural resource ecology, and more importantly, what it means to us. <laughs>